The challenge of the Yukon. Oh, King! Have you me? The Wonder Dog King, swiftest and strongest of Eskimo lead dogs, blazes the trail through storm and snow for Sergeant Preston as he meets the challenge of the Yukon. Sergeant Preston was typical of the small band of Northwest Mounted Police who preserved law and order in the new Northwest country, where the greed for wealth and power led to frequent violence and bloodshed. But in spite of the odds against them, Sergeant Preston and his wonder dog king met that challenge, and justice ruled triumphant. In 1833, Alaska and the Yukon Territory were for the first time invaded by white men. Before these men appeared, the Yukon had known countless generations of peace, inhabited only by Indians who were disinterested in the yellow flakes of glittering ore they found in clear streams and along riverbanks. To them, animal skins were far more valuable, and it was for the same skins the Count Igor Petronovich made the journey to an unknown land. But any furs the handful of white Russians secured were never to grace imperial robes in faraway St. Petersburg. It was late in an afternoon in the year 1834. A tribe of frenzied savages gave voice to a cry of triumph as they watched a fort the Russians had built go up in flames. They thought they had killed all of the white men when suddenly a tall, dark-haired man with flashing eyes walked toward them. His hand was raised. And in it was a small figure carved in ivory, studded with rubies and diamonds. Behind him walked an Indian. Munalak, what are these peace-loving countrymen of yours saying? Why do they bow down in front of me? Can they know who I am? Do they know they killed the men I brought with me? I, Count Igor Petronovich, from the court of Tsar Nicholas himself? Them see fire in eye of little man you hold in hand. Them think you fire gun. Walk through fire, not be burned. Oh, so they don't know I was not in the fort, huh? Tell them they must take me to their village. They must start building me a boat. Tell them, do you hear? Tell them they have displeased the fire god. And unless they do as I command, fire will descend on their villages. Their people will be killed. Count Igor Petronovich joined an expedition at the headwaters of the Yukon River and set sail for his native Russia, thinking the idol he left behind was a small price to pay for his life. As for the idol itself, it remained with the Yukon Indians. Many years passed before white men again disturbed the peace of the North Country. The tribe moved their quarters and settled near a lake, the chief himself carrying the sacred figure to the site of their new village. Then... 1897, and in the white man's world, excitement was everywhere. Gold had been discovered in the Yukon. Sally Lawson, with her stepbrother Tom and Jim Wilson, left Dawson far behind them as their sleds covered the frozen trails. Four days passed, and then a week. And in the middle of the second week, as they sat beside a campfire... Sally spoke to Jim Wilson, glancing occasionally at her stepbrother, who stood inside the tent flap, studying a piece of paper. He hardly talks anymore, Jim. It's been tough on you, hasn't it, Sally? You never should have come in the first place. Perhaps not. But Tom's the only relative I have, and I didn't want to stay by myself back in Seattle. Seattle. Seems like a long way from here, doesn't it? I guess it does. Only... I wish you wouldn't worry about this. Tom got that map from an old timer. He paid him for it, Sally. Whatever he paid for it, I'm beginning to think the whole thing's a fake. I think we should turn back. We'll wait a few more days. Give him a chance to prove he's right. Remember, part of my money's wrapped up in that sheet of paper, too. Well, we can hope for the best anyway. Tom, I'm going to turn in. All right. We'll start early in the morning. Good night. Good, Good night, night, Sally. Tom. Sally's worried. Oh, she doesn't know what it's Tom, about. Tom, I want you to be truthful with me. You've been off the track these last few days, haven't you? Well, what do you mean? Just what I said. We couldn't go back now even if we wanted to, could we? 
We're lost, isn't that it? Yeah, that's it. And there's only one thing to do. Keep going. It was a week and a half later that an Indian scout found them, wandering in the snow, half dead from hunger, half crazed with despair. They were taken to the Indian village. In one of the tents, Tom Lawson talked to the poker-faced Indian who'd saved their lives. We sure are grateful to you. You've saved our lives. Indian friend, white man. Yeah. I wouldn't think you'd seen any white men to be friends with. We see many white men... Policeman wear red coat, him talk to chief now. We see white man long, long time by. Him bring fire god to win it. Fire god, huh? Who's that? Well? The unanswered question aroused Tom Lawson's curiosity until finally, piece by piece, from various men of the tribe that had befriended him, he got the story and a description of the idol that couldn't be bought with any amount of gold. Have you heard anything about it, Sally? I? Goodness, no, Tom. What do I care about the superstitions of these people? They've been kind to us, that's all that matters. You haven't seen that mitten of mine, have you? It must be worth plenty. It can't be bought, they say. I wish you'd forget about that little fire gun. If I don't find my mitten, my left hand will be... That must be Jim. I hope he's found it for me. Oh, Miss Lawson. Oh, how are you, Sergeant? Hello, Tom. Howdy. I just stopped by for a minute. About the mitten you lost. Did you find it? Oh, no, I didn't find it, but you certainly can't get along with only one, so I brought an extra pair of mine over. Probably too big for you, but at least they'll be warm. Oh, well, that's very generous of you. Not at all. Well, now I've got to get back. The Indians are having a meeting, and I've got to sit in on it. That was nice of him, wasn't it? Mmm, these are warm. You know, Tom, I think we might as well go back to Dawson. That map of yours is worthless. Maybe we won't get the gold we came after. But what if we could get something that would be worth a lot more than gold? Worth more than gold? Never mind, Sally. We'll get set to mush in the morning. They left the village early the next day. Tom drove the dogs hard, and by the time darkness had fallen, they'd covered about 30 miles. That night in camp, Tom called to his sister and Jim Wilson. What is it, Tom? Something wrong? No, no, no. I just wanted to show you something. Look. Hmm, what an ugly thing. Why, it's carved ivory. Yes, and those awful devilish-looking red eyes. Almost look as if there's fire dancing in the... Tom. Tom, you didn't take it. You did... <laughs> sure, I took it. And just look at it. It's worth a fortune. Tom, you shouldn't have. When the Indians discover something... She's right. They'll be on our trail in no time. You've got to take that After all the trouble ahead getting it, not on your life. Sally, hand me that extra mitten of yours. What extra mitten? Tom, you've got to take that back. Come on, come on, give it to me. Preston gave you a pair, so you've got two right ones. Now, slip the idol inside it. Hmm. A fortune in diamonds and rubies... And it fits inside a mitten. When the next day dawned sharp and clear, Sally Lawson came out of the tent to find Jim Wilson standing beside the embers of the campfire. Good morning, Jim. I'll start breakfast right away. Isn't Tom up yet? He's gone. Must have cleared out during the night. He took the sled with him. When the Indians come hightailing after us, it'll be you and me they'll catch. Well, Tom's making a getaway with a little fire gun. The Indians arrived at the camp a short time later, and with them was Sergeant Preston and the great dog King. Preston and the chief of the tribe listened to the story the man and the girl told. But as the Mountie nodded, there was a wary distrust in the old Indian's eyes. Fire God gone. You take Indian fire God. Indian kill you. They didn't steal the fire guard, but the man who was with them did. You can't kill them, Chief Owega. That would be murder, and you'll pay with your own life you take theirs. You say you catch them, thief? Yes. Bring them back to village with fire guard? Yes. Uh, we take man and girl to village. All right, and I'll go find your fire guard. 
I'm king. I'm you husky. <laughs> Meanwhile, Tom Lawson found to himself as he rode the runners of his sled. Yes, sir. I'd like to know that mitten's right in front of me on the sled where I can see it. Only the, the darn things keep blurring. I, it's my eyes. Duh. Just as if I had sand in them. Ho, you Malamutes! Ho! I make sure that mitten's there. I can't. Ooh. I know what's wrong with my eyes. Sally's got the snow goggles in her pack. But I'm snow blind. I, I gotta get my hand on the bar of the sled. There. Now mush, mush, you malamutes! Hey! Hey, the dogs are leaving me! I can't see! I'm blind! I'm snow blind! When the dogs pulled, the sled had given a sudden forward lurch, throwing Tom Lawson off balance. He fell headlong in the snow. And as he raised himself on one arm, he could hear, but not see, his dogs fading in the distance. Struggling on in the snow, he was unaware of Sergeant Preston, who was already close on his heels. Mm, strange, that turn he made in the trail several miles back. Whether Lawson knows it or not, he's heading back to the Indian village. Maybe he intends to return the idol. Now, wait a minute. How are you, Huskies? <laughs> so you already discovered it, huh, fella? Tom's footprints go one way and his sled the other. He fell here, and the sled went on without him. Well, we'll follow him. King took his place at the head of the Mounties' dog team. And as they covered the trail, his sharp ears caught the sound of another pack in the distance. Turning, King cut through the timber, the sound of the snarling dog serving as his compass. Following the tracks of the driverless dog team, King stopped suddenly. For a moment, he was puzzled. And then he slowly approached the supplies that were sprawled in the snow. He saw where the sled had overturned and had been dragged down by the dogs he could still hear. Seconds went by as the dogs sniffed the air. A familiar scent filled his nostrils. Quickly, he found its source, Preston's mitten. In the Indian village, Sergeant Preston stood facing a circle of men who'd become suddenly unfriendly. Beside the Mountie stood Tom Lawson. His hands rubbing his burning eyes. Him take fire gun. Him no have fire gun. That's right. He doesn't have it with him, but it's on his sled. I'll uh, go after the sled. Sergeant Preston tell us him bring back fire gun. Him not keep promise. He didn't no keep promise. You must trust me, Chief, and I'll bring it back. The policeman's words fell on deaf ears. A circle of faces began to close in on the Mountie and his companion. And then, looking beyond the Indians, Sergeant Preston saw King running toward him. King! King, old fella. <laughs> Where'd you find my mitten? I didn't lose it. There's something in it. King, old boy, you certainly saved the day this time. Chief, is this what you're looking for? Oh. You you bring back fire god. You keep promise. Sergeant, are, are they going to kill us? No, they're not going to kill anybody. But to tell you the truth, I was mighty worried for a few minutes. Oh, Sergeant, isn't that the mitten you gave me? How did you... It... It's for the right hand. That's the one Tom took to put the idol in. Sergeant Preston, Chief Owega heap sorry him not believe you when you say you bring Fire God back. Indian never again not believe what you tell him. What's he talking about, Sergeant? You mean you found the idol in the mitten? I didn't find it, Miss Lawson. My partner did. Your partner? Yes, King found it. <coughs> yes, fella... Thanks to you, this case is closed. These copyrighted dramas originate in the studios of WXYZ Detroit, and all characters, names, places, and incidents used are fictitious. They are sent to you each week at the same time. 